What's up everyone, how are we all doing? Back with another video. Hi guys. Cold War Part, look at us sticking to a schedule. I know, we said we'd be back tomorrow, we're here, we're ready. I know, we're ready. I, th I think it's the first time we've ever actually, you know, come through on a problem, <laughs> so, yeah. Because we're excited because we've got all this new stuff to play with, we're like, okay, we'll film yeah, again. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> just because it's so easy. Right, Cold War Part 2. I think I remember where we left off. Um... Might do, 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 does he do a recap? I can't remember. Eisenhower just took over as president. I remember that. Yeah. Well, I remember all of it, but that's where we, I think we got up to. No, I think About Kennedy any... was the president when we left it. Kennedy? Yeah. No, it was Eisenhower, wasn't it? Oh, he took over from Kennedy, didn't he? No, he took over from Truman. And I think Kennedy takes over from Eisenhower. And then Nixon takes over. <laughs> I think that's I how it works. I don't know the order. I think that's how it works. I don't know. I'm about to get proved wrong. So. <laughs> Thanks. Support my channel by signing up using the link below and get your first two months for free. For anyone who thinks recent US history has never been as crazy as it is right now, allow me to present to you the 1960s, extreme cultural division, major political assassinations, and the closest the world has ever come to nuclear apocalypse. Shocked by the CIA's intrusive methods for putting down socialism in Latin America, a certain Fidel Castro met with a certain Che Guevara in a bar in Mexico City, and the two of them decided they should grow some awesome beards and overthrow the Cuban government, which is exactly what they did. Cuba had been America's summer playground, and America didn't like seeing a communist regime being set up in its own backyard. So the US immediately began training up Cuban exiles to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro. However, as the day of the operation came closer, Kennedy wanted to conceal any US involvement in the plan. So he massively scaled back American air support, and as a result, the Bay of Pigs invasion was a humiliating defeat for America. But Castro felt there was still an impending US threat to his regime. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev had a lot of medium-range nuclear missiles that couldn't reach America, but they could if they were positioned, say, on an exotic Caribbean island off the coast of Florida. Hey, I'm a communist who hates America. You're a communist who hates America. You know what that means? We should fall in love. Uh, I was just going to suggest you set your missiles up in Cuba. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're right. That's a better idea. So Be still, my beating heart. Is this what the Cuban Missile Crisis then was? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. On October 14th, 1962, a U-2 spy plane over Cuba noticed something strange. Sir, you need to look at this photograph. You're right. Oh, he is Kennedy. See, well, I, I stand. Well, I pay attention. Well, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's very spy... rare that that happens. Isn't oh it? no, that happens quite a lot. We just don't catch it on camera, conveniently. <laughs> <laughs> that bit just somehow disappears from the video. <laughs> no, okay, I stand corrected. I apologise. Be still, my beating heart. On October 14th, 1962, a U-2 spy plane over Cuba noticed something strange. Sir, you need to look at this photograph. You're right! That's the cutest dog I've ever seen! Sir, I was referring more to the Soviet missiles. America freaked out as they realized what was going on. They were completely vulnerable, and they had to act fast. They knew that airstrikes or an invasion of Cuba would- I love how everyone in uh, Oregon is safe. Just everyone here. Like. They were completely yeah. vulnerable and <laughs> completely they had to fine. act fast. They knew that airstrikes or an invasion of Cuba would likely mean nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So Kennedy came up with another idea, a blockade. The US Navy announced it would stop and search any Soviet ships heading to Cuba and would sink any that did not comply. In response, the Soviet put its military into full combat readiness. The US did the same and began drawing up plans for an attack on Cuba. Things were escalating fast and both superpowers were getting ready for World War III. Emergency communications between the two sides broke down as Khrushchev rejected Kennedy's demands for the missiles to be removed. And for the first time in history, US Strategic Air Command moved to DEFCON 2. Anyone want to go get a burger? <laughs> I love our number four is Russia, please. <laughs> DEFCON 1 means nuclear war. The Soviets shot down a U-2 spy plane over Cuba. A Soviet nuclear submarine in the Caribbean mistakenly believed war had already broken out, and two of the senior officers gave the go-ahead to fire its nuclear torpedo. Thankfully, the third senior officer, this beautiful man, refused to authorize the decision. The US finalized its preparations, and I kid you not, the day before the US were set to decide the day and time for the Cuban invasion, Khrushchev was like, hey, you know if you just removed your missiles from Turkey, we'd remove ours from Cuba? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good to me. It was a bit more complicated than that, but at the last second, the two sides finally came to an agreement. Soviet missiles were shipped out of Cuba, and the world breathed one gigantic sigh of relief. Except for one guy, who was bloody livid. Phew! Let's hope that's the- I know, like, can- I know it's oversimplified in that, but can you imagine, like, the emotions of people living in the 60s? I'm not sure how knowledgeable the public were to like how close they were to the end of the war. I imagine pretty knowledgeable. Yeah. But imagine like, you know, Boris coming on the TV and saying we're possibly a day away from like 
Nuclear war. Nuclear war. I know he wouldn't have come out and said it on TV, but... I'd get me some glasses yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's where that big, like, um, you know, people living in fallout shelters today. You yeah. know, people living in bunkers. Do you reckon this is, like, where that first... Well, maybe. I mean... And if the time ever came, everyone would be jealous of everyone that's got a bunker. I think, yeah, like when you're watching it as oversimplified, you forget that it's like real life panic. Yeah. Unless the bunkers are owned by Voltec and, you know, Fallout. Yeah. When they do them crazy experiments in the vaults. Oh, yeah, I don't want to go in one of them ones. Yeah, they're the good ones. <laughs> Gigantic sigh of relief, except for one guy who is bloody livid. View. <laughs> Let's hope that's the biggest crisis of my presidency. Unfortunately for him, his presidency was to end with one. Having nearly blown up the planet, a few changes were made. First, the superpowers agreed to a limited test ban treaty. Secondly, the Soviets ousted Khrushchev and replaced him with Leonid Brezhnev, who was a kisser. He liked to kiss. Both sides were deeply concerned at the prospect of nuclear war, but still, that, the arms race raged. Was that like a... When he said he likes to kiss, does that mean that was like his greeting, or does that mean he just liked to kiss men? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I hope it's not the last one. <laughs> Gay? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> on. Throughout the 60s and 70s, US intelligence worked out that the Soviets' nuclear arsenal was not as powerful as they previously thought, but in fact, it was America that held the advantage. ABMs and MIRVs were developed, and the doctrine of MAD. If both sides knew they would be completely destroyed by a nuclear war, neither would risk starting one. But even without war, the world was already feeling the effects of nuclear weapons. In 1966, above the pleasant town of Palomares in Spain, a US bomber collided with a tanker mid-air, and four hydrogen bombs fell and landed near the town below. It hasn't exploded, so I'm sure everything's fine. Whoa, boy. Uh, <laughs> hey, I wouldn't eat that if I were you. Okay. What were you going to do today? Go for a swim? Yeah, I wouldn't. Are you breathing right now? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't. It took the Americans <laughs> two and a half months to find one of the bombs, which had gone missing in the ocean. This was the 14th time America had lost a nuclear bomb since 1950. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> is that where they got where they lost all the bombs? Yeah. That is literally, we are in the center of that Rex. <laughs> there was, um, people are finding things like that all the time, don't they? Someone found one in a park in Bolton a few weeks ago. Oh, and they had to shut off yeah. the whole park. No, not nuclear bomb. Not just, a nuclear bomb, yeah. just like a regular bomb. Just a regular bomb. <laughs> Nobody knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost. So sleep well tonight. After Kennedy's assassination, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson took over, and he inherited a developing crisis in the East, Vietnam. Back in the 50s, the Vietnamese had kicked their French colonizers out once and for all, and the country was divided into two. In the North, a communist regime, and in the South, an anti-communist regime. Both were led by very sweet-looking old men, but don't let that deceive you. They were both ruthless dictators, and both dreamed of reuniting Vietnam under their own regime. So the North established the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, to carry out a campaign of guerrilla warfare in the South with Soviet support. The US sent advisors to help train the South Vietnamese to deal with the threat, but President Diem's brutal policies pushed more and more South Vietnamese to support the Viet Cong. And over the next decade, the situation escalated to a breaking point. America feared the domino effect. That is, if South Vietnam fell to communism, would Cambodia be next? Then Laos? Thailand? Burma? India? LBJ had to make a choice between losing South Vietnam or sending in the troops. And so in they went. From 1965, America found itself in a war unlike anything it had ever fought before. Let's play Spot the Viet Cong. I still maintain just from like military history and that that the Viet Cong War like the war in Vietnam and the Eastern Front in World War 2 mm. have got to be the two worst places to be like I can't think of anything worse than them to yeah like, you in, wouldn't want to be in the middle of that would you yeah in the middle of like in the middle of a war you wouldn't want to be in the Eastern Front because it was freeze and you were undersupplied and like the fighting was so brutal but they're walking through that hot, humid jungle where the fucking the fall can fall like. Do you think that half the people just collapsed from it being like so hot? And wow! Imagine all the booby traps. Like imagine the mind games that would play. Like they had like spike pits in the floor, and that like you fall through and just land in a spike pit or something. Oh or, god, that'd be horrible. You'd be honestly, paranoid. Yeah. Mm -mm. I read a book. It was because uh, there were some Australian soldiers in the Vietnamese War. I, I don't know why I keep saying that in the Vietnam War, and. Uh, some of the stuff they went through was unreal. Uh, the American soldiers and the Australians, I mean. Really? Yeah. Didn't they, like, when they had pits in the floor, if people fell in the spike pit, they'd have to use other people's bodies to, like, walk across them and stuff? Oh, God. 
I imagine there was some horrible stuff. I can't believe we're only five minutes in. I'll stop pausing now. Sorry. Soldier. <laughs> Did you see him? Of course not. That's because millions of young American men were drafted and sent to fight a ruthless enemy who used the thick jungle as its shield. It was nearly impossible to tell where the enemy was, or worse, who it was. And as a result, the civilian population got caught up in the brutal crossfire. The city of Saigon found itself under regular attack, and America launched a bombing campaign in the north during Operation Rolling Thunder. The Viet Cong used the Ho Chi Minh Trail running through Laos and Cambodia to supply the campaign. It was a long and brutal war, and I could never do it justice in this video. But in terms of the Cold War, Vietnam was probably the biggest of many, many global conflicts that signaled a turning point. Under the threat of nuclear war, the two superpowers began working to make their relationship more constructive. And as a result, their ideological battle shifted away from the potential of direct conflict and more towards attempting to influence smaller proxy wars around the world. In the Middle East, the Soviet Union provided aid against Israel during the Six Day War. And then again, when the US backed Israel during the Yom Kippur War. In Africa, the Angolan Civil War saw US supported South Africans fighting Soviet supported Cubans. In the conflict between Somalia and Ethiopia, the superpowers interestingly switched sides as regimes changed, and the US continued fighting the spread of communism in its own backyard, funding the famous Contra groups to fight the socialist junta in Nicaragua. These proxy wars were fierce enough to begin with, but superpower intervention amplified the destruction and created alarming levels of human suffering throughout oh the third world. Oh my god. I gotta be honest, I've never heard of most of these. Well, like, heard of them, but like, never actually looked into it. Like the sand war, I couldn't tell you what that was. A lot of them speak for themselves in the names, but and more. World like and we in Vietnam. Know a lot about these like Nigerian civil war and like other like civil wars. No, the we Congo crisis. Destruction and created alarming levels of human suffering throughout the third world. And in Vietnam, that human suffering was all being broadcast back home by a good old television. Going into the late 60s, America was a changing nation. This became this. This became this. And this became this. The new slogan that was taking root, make love, not war. The majority of Americans did not approve of Johnson's handling of the Vietnam War. And in 1968, a silent majority elected law and order candidate Richard Nixon. As the Vietnam War appeared to be increasingly unwinnable and public opinion turning increasingly sour, Nixon made the decision to begin bringing the troops home and ended US involvement in Vietnam by 1973. Two years later, the South fell. The Cold War was now taking its toll on both superpowers. In Russia, a huge percentage of the budget was still going to the military. People were still hungry, and they just didn't have access to the same lifestyle and goods as the West. And what did they have to show for it? They weren't even winning the space race anymore. Both sides needed to reduce spending in order to rescue their economies, and so both welcomed with open arms an easing of hostilities, otherwise known as détente. To improve relations, Nixon became the first US president to visit Moscow in 1972, and Brezhnev returned the gesture a year later. A number of treaties were signed, including the 1972 SALT agreement that limited nuclear weapons. Relations with China were even improving via ping-pong diplomacy when the US table tennis team went on a tour of the People's Republic. However, internally, China was still pushing anti-capitalist propaganda, which led to some mixed messages. Nixon even visited China in 1972, and it was a barrel of laughs. Today, the president walks among priceless treasures from China's golden age. Among them, a pair of ear stoppers used by the emperor to keep from hearing criticism. He put the stopper into his ears so that he wouldn't, he wouldn't hear the criticism. Give me a pair of ears. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was going great for Nixon until it was uncovered that back home he was being a very naughty boy and violating constitutional protocol. I mean, we did our research, by the way, on that, didn't we? Yeah, we did look into that. Yeah, because that one video where it stumped us, man, it was so frustrating. But comments put me right quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It's like if people don't tell you, you don't know. Do you? Oh yeah, for sure. Announcing today my resignation as president, and I'm passing the office to my vice president, Gerald Ford. Wow, you mean in America the people can actually remove their leader when he breaks the law? Why not just rule by force? Where's the corruption? And my first act as president is to pardon Nixon. Ah, there it is. <laughs> After the whole fiasco, Americans decided what they really wanted was just a nice safe guy who wouldn't cheat on them. So they elected Jimmy Carter, and the two sides met in Vienna where they signed yet another strategic arms limitation treaty. It's an honor, Premier Brezhnev. Likewise, President Carter. 
please don't do that. <laughs> but that's not to say there was no longer any tension between the two sides, because there was. Heaps of it. Once again, the Soviet Union put down further attempts at reform and rebellion in the Eastern Bloc. The Euro missile crisis saw new and improved classes of intermediate range missiles being deployed in Europe. In 1979, the Soviets thought it would be a good idea if they had their own Vietnam and invaded Afghanistan to prevent a US sponsored Islamic insurgency. And in response to these various crises, Olympic Games were boycotted. Conservatives were concerned that US policy had become too soft. And in 1980, they decided they wanted a president who would be tough on communism. So they elected Ronald Reagan. And Reagan came in guns blazing. Concerned at the Soviet Union's human rights violations, he made a speech calling them an evil. Reagan, probably behind Trump actually now. He's got to be the most controversial president, right? Because, and this is just based off like comment sections and like online what, what people, people talk. But Americans, like you, you guys are so 50 50 on Reagan, like, and, and Trump, obviously. I think Reagan probably more so because Trump even has like conservatives that aren't really fans of him. But uh, Reagan is, like, some say, oh, he's the best president we've ever had. Some say he's by far the worst. It's kind of like how Maggie Thatcher is here. Yeah, it did kind of, I feel like some of them were a bit like a love-hate and that's it. Yeah, like, I, I personally thought Maggie was a good, I went around, but from what I've... I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, from, <laughs> from what I've researched, like, she was a good prime minister, but a lot of people, especially in the north, have been like, the... the uh, you know, the working communities, the miners and all that, they yeah. hate, like, really hate her. But you celebrate can... her death. <laughs> they do, yeah, don't they? They, they, do. they celebrate her death. You can have, Disgusting. like, the opinion, though, that, like, the you don't like them as a person, but they do as a, a good job as being a leader. Yeah. But just because you agree they do a good job doesn't mean you have to like them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't know. But I, I think it's disgusting, like, annually, northerners... Not northerners, like, as a whole, but... Yeah, please don't group me. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, it's, it's easier to just say lefties, to be honest. Like, lefties just annually celebrate her death. Like, it's so bad. But, uh, I, don't know, I don't know. Now that you live in Manchester, when the anniversary comes around, you're going to see, like, parades and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the Midlands, so that's usually quite, like, a neutral area. Like, it slides either way. But in, in the north, you guys are, like, quite liberal and, like... How do I say it? Open. Yeah, we're a very relaxed city. You can come here and do whatever you want yeah. and be however you want to be. It's kind of like if it, if it was like in America, moving from like somewhere semi-neutral, like uh, Oklahoma, maybe like who's slightly more conservative, I believe, and just moving to like California and to being, LA. <laughs> yeah, to LA and being like, wow, that's anything a, goes here. Like, wow, that's a man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but we're getting distracted. We'll carry on. They wanted a president who would be tough on communism, so they elected Ronald Reagan. And Reagan came in guns blazing. Concerned at the Soviet Union's human rights violations, he made a speech calling them an evil empire. And he also wanted to renew the arms race using technological advances in computing and lasers. He came up with the Space Defense Initiative, also known as Star Wars, which was basically a big defensive anti-nuke shield around the country. But a lot of people thought it was a pretty dumb idea. The Soviet Union perceived this shift in rhetoric as the USA getting ready for war. And they were feeling especially threatened as their relationship with their communist ally China had broken down. Relations took a big hit in 1983 when the Soviets shot down a Korean airliner that had strayed into their airspace and it looked like the world was going right back to mid 20th century Cold War tension. But then Brezhnev got really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and was replaced by this guy who was really old and died and he was replaced by Mikhail Gorbachev. Coming into oh, office shit. in 1985, he was the real game changer. His philosophy differed a lot from previous Soviet leaders. He felt that the reason the Soviet system and economy was struggling was that it didn't allow the Soviet people to find satisfaction in their work because they weren't allowed to speak freely and lived in fear. Gorbachev wanted the Soviet people to be happy, but unlike previous Soviet leaders, he actually made the change happen. Within the first couple of years, he began the political movement for more openness and transparency and the restructuring of the Soviet political and economic systems. And change very quickly took effect. People could criticize the government, they could enjoy Western pop culture, the media interviewed Margaret Thatcher, but most importantly, the Soviet people could now enjoy Pizza Hut. All hail to Gorbachev. He also knew that the arms race needed to end in order to rescue the Soviet economy, and a positive relationship with the West must be established. Constructive dialogue reopened and resulted in the INF Treaty, which saw all intermediate range missiles eliminated, which was huge. Reagan's tone towards the Soviet Union began to soften, and things were looking up. 
But what would these reforms mean for the Eastern Bloc? For decades, the Soviets had been brutally suppressing any attempt at change. Now, would they be allowed? And that was the exact question on Hungary's lips when the Prime Minister visited Moscow. Gorbachev's response, he didn't necessarily agree with the reforms, but he wouldn't stop them either. He was prepared to let the Eastern Bloc choose its own future. This was massive, and the Hungarian leaders began planning free, multi-party elections. Poland followed suit and also held elections in June. The anti-Soviet party Solidarity won 99 out of 100 seats in the Senate. But not just that. In Hungary, the barbed wire border between East and West was removed. The Iron Curtain was unraveling. But not all Eastern Bloc leaders were happy. Notably, East Germany was still ruled by a hardline Stalinist, Erich Honecker, and many East Germans were still eager to get out. They had been trapped by the Berlin Wall, but now they were doing the math. If they could travel to Hungary, and Hungary's border with the West was loosening, could they now make it to the West? That summer, East Germans decided Hungary was the latest top holiday <laughs> destination. They traveled there in droves, and using various methods, tens of thousands crossed the border into Austria and the West. Honecker was furious and Bloc traveled to Hungary, but that civil liberties train had started rolling and it wasn't stopping. Thousands more flocked to the West German Embassy in Prague, where they stormed the fence around the embassy gardens and a temporary <laughs> refugee camp was set up. In September, deals were struck to allow the refugees to travel west via train. Back in East Germany, the people were running on a civil liberties high and they wanted their next hit. Dissent was growing. Over time, demonstrations turned to mass protest, with plainclothes secret police officers doing their best to put down the dissent. But it had grown well out of their control. And worse, the biggest demonstration was yet to come. We're gonna put all of this down by force. Right, guys? Guys? Unfortunately, everyone had realized what he had not. This was bigger than them, and the entire East German Politburo voted him out of power. On November 4th, over half a million East Germans took to the streets of East Berlin. For many, there was still one big target left in their sights. That damn wall. The pressure on the East German government was too great, and on November 9th, they made a bit of a chaotic announcement that the travel ban between East and West was being lifted. The change wasn't meant to take effect until the next day, and crossing guards still had orders to shoot on sight any who tried to cross. But that night, huge crowds gathered at the crossing points, and the guards were overwhelmed. In an astronomically historic moment, after decades of family separation and travel restriction, the people were allowed to pass through. East and West Berliners couldn't believe it, and celebrated together throughout the night. Some even climbed the wall and began to topple it. The Iron Curtain had fallen, and a year later, Germany would be reunited. Elections in Bulgaria, a peaceful revolution in Czechoslovakia, and a violent one in Romania brought to an end communist authority in the Eastern Bloc. America decided it would be best if it just stayed away and let the change happen, as the anti-communist movement continued all the way back to Moscow. Gorbachev had given the people the freedom to demonstrate. Now, they demonstrated for an end to the communist single-party rule, and Gorbachev had to give in. For the first time in history, elections were held in which candidates not officially endorsed by the party were allowed to run. Ambitious rival of Gorbachev, Boris Yeltsin, led a democratic movement. Now things here get quite confusing, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union is a complicated topic. So believe me, this is oversimplified, but it went a little bit like this. The Soviet Union was made up of a number of smaller Soviet republics, the largest of which was Russia. Yeltsin got himself elected the president of Russia, and began a struggle for sovereignty against Gorbachev and the greater Soviet Union. Communist hardliners were horrified at what Gorbachev was allowing, so they briefly kidnapped him and tried to set up their own emergency government. But Yeltsin and his supporters all gathered around the White House in Moscow and were like, no. We have a tank. So the hardliners had to concede and released Gorbachev. Wow, thanks Boris. That was a close one. No problem. And thanks to you for all the great freedom you've given us. Any time, pal. And just to inform you, I've used that freedom you've given us to go behind your back and make a deal with Ukraine and Belarus to dissolve the Soviet Union and set up the Russian Federation. In other words, you're no longer in charge. I am. Dude. <laughs> so uncool. And so decades of tension and the everlasting threat of nuclear war finally came to an end as democratic governments were established in many of the old Soviet republics, and the world got along together forever after. Right, guys? <laughs> Wait, was that Theresa May? Along oh, together God. forever after. Right, guys? Whoa. Whoa. Calm down. Yeah, there she yeah, is. <laughs> ledge. <laughs> nah, she wasn't. <laughs> she was probably the opposite of a ledge. But man, it's crazy how many of these faces have changed. What I say? He's on his way out. I don't know who that is. Friend, France, Germany. She, she feel like she's been in power forever. Trump's obviously gone. And Biden's there. Is he India? I think he's India. He might be Pakistan. I can't, I can't remember. Semi-racist, but there's orange on 
Is yeah, like, I think I'm pretty sure it's India. No, yeah, it's India. It's like yeah, India for sure. Because of the flag. Yeah. But uh, I think that's my favourite one. Really? I think Cold War is my favourite one, to be honest. I enjoyed that. I, th- I just feel like the World War Two ones were too short, but I know there was his first videos. I feel yeah. like if he would have done the World War Two ones later, they would have been like the best ones. Yeah. I'm excited for some of the ones. Like I'm excited that, like the, bleh, 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 the independent ones, like the Prohibition and stuff, though. Oh, yeah. forgot about that. Prohibition. When would the Prohibition have been? Prohibition would have been before this, technically, I think. Okay. But uh, if you want us to do the prohibition, we will. But I think we got to do Rome tomorrow. Yeah, part, well, part we, three. we don't want to make promises. Are we yeah. going to upload tomorrow or probably Tuesday? Oh yeah, it's your birthday tomorrow. It's my birthday tomorrow. It's so back- if we upload tomorrow, we'll be steaming. So I think we yeah. better not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Tuesday then. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay, Tuesday. Um, back with Rome. Yeah. Let us let, let us know what you got. <laughs> Keep shouting. <laughs> I'm paranoid that the mic's too quiet, but I think it's fine. No, it's all right. Yeah, let us know what you guys thought. Where do you rank the Cold War in your favourite ones? For me, it's probably first. I've only just noticed how white Donald Trump's teeth are. But I don't know if that's because his skin's kind of orange. He doesn't look that orange in that picture. No, he's got a, he's got a filter on. <laughs> <laughs> he's got, definitely got a filter on. I feel like really white teeth is just like an American thing. No, it's just that we have horrible teeth. We don't have horrible teeth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to get terrified in the comments, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, you, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> You're going to talk like this in all the videos. <laughs> right. Thanks for joining us, guys. Take it easy and uh, have a great day. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff.